I want to start off by telling you a story. There was a Pharisee and he came to Yeshua and he said, Yeshua, do you want to come and dine with me tonight? And Yeshua comes into his house. A, a woman from outside comes in and she's known as a sinner. She comes up behind Yeshua by his feet and she, her tears are tearing down her face, so much so that she's using these tears as the water to wet his feet. And she's taking her hair and she's wiping his feet with her hair. And the Pharisee seeing this thinks to himself, if this man is a prophet, he'd know what kind of a woman this is. And as Yeshua observes, because he has a spiritual gift of words of knowledge, he knows what people are thinking. And, and he says, Simon, the Pharisee, Simon, can I tell you something? And he says, sure. Well, see, Simon, there was a money lender and he had two debtors. The one owed him 50 denarii, the other one owed him 150 denarii. And then the money lender came and he decided, I'm going to forgive both of your debt, just wipe it clean like it was never there. Which one of the debtors would love the money lender for more for doing that? And the Pharisee says, well, I suppose the one who had the greater debt. And Yeshua says, yes, exactly. You see, Simon, you see this woman? When I walked into this place, you offered me no water. But she has not ceased to water my feet with her tears. You see, Simon, when I walked into this place, you offered me no kiss, but she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You see, Simon, when I walked into this place, you did not anoint my head with oil, but she has not ceased to anoint my feet with ointment. You see, she had many sins which are now forgiven, for the one who is forgiven much loves much. And that's, that's the end of the story. That's where he leaves it. And it's kind of like, I wonder what he was, Simon was thinking. He, he likely thought something like, well, yeah, that's a good point. She's, she's the way she is because she's a sinner. I'm so glad I'm not like her. You see, but he, and he likely missed, I don't know if he ever got the point, but he likely missed it. Because see, he thought of himself. You know, when you look at what he, Yeshua did for the woman, he told her later in the chapter, your sins are forgiven. And he also told her, number two, you are saved. Like he told her, he gave her assurance of forgiveness and assurance of salvation. And he didn't tell any of that to Simon, to the Pharisee, to the host who was inviting him. The woman, the sinner, walked away justified and the Pharisee walked away with nothing. You see, Simon thought that he had less sin than she did. But yet, he walked away with all his sin. She walked away with none. But th because the reality is, is even though he likely was a religious man, he, could, he went to synagogue every Sabbath, he, he kept his Sabbath, his feast days, he, he had it all in line, his ducks in a row, he may even be in the leadership at the synagogues or the Sanhedrin, who knew? He was a holy man, that's definitely what he thought. But was he? See, because honestly, when you look at how Yeshua treats him, he treats her her as a righteous woman and him as an unrighteous man. But it's flipped, doesn't it? But see, the thing is that the Pharisee didn't see his own sin. The greatest of which was that he thought of himself as so much more holy, clean, righteous compared to this unclean woman, this sinner who knows where she has been. And that sin of looking down upon that woman was the sin that he did not repent from and disqualified him from receiving what that very woman he despised received. Think about that for a second. Because so oftentimes it's easy for us. This is what the enemy comes with. He comes with this bait. He, he wants us to do, like He allows us to do religious things as, lo as long as it makes us puff up. Just like, that's a great analogy of the leaven. And 
it puffs us up the leaven of the Pharisees. And now with this, we, the greatest danger is when we start looking at others and start thinking of them the way that that Pharisee thought of that woman. You see, when we look at the story of Jonah, this is a story that's so interesting to me because when we, when we look at it, people think about the story of Jonah as the message being, you know, oh, don't, don't run from your calling. And that's the message, and that's true. That's a part of the message. But I want to submit to you that that's not even half of it. The bigger question is why Jonah was running, why he didn't want to go there. You see, Jonah is, God comes to Jonah and he tells Jonah, Jonah, I want to send you to Nineveh to call my people there who do not know me, who are in sin, to repentance. And what does Jonah do? Instead, he gets on, goes to Joppa, gets on a boat to, to, uh, on Joppa to a place called Tarshish, not Nineveh. And he's on this boat and he's below deck, he's sleeping and he's like, I'm not gonna go there. And he's sleeping below deck. And as he's sleeping below deck, suddenly outside of this boat, there is a wind that picks up. And there is some waves that start picking up and the boat starts getting rocked back and forth and back and forth. But Jonah is downstairs sleeping. And the men upstairs manning the boat, they're getting afraid. So much so that they start throwing things overboard, lighten the load. This is serious. We can die today. This is the message. And they go down. Eventually, the captain finds Jonah, wakes him up, says, come, help us. And eventually, it comes out that Jonah comes forward and says, well, I think that this is because of what I have done, because I'm running. And this is God who has come forth and he is now shaking this boat. And they say, well, what are we, what are we going to do? And he says, well, you can throw me in overboard, as you know. And now they come and they take Jonah, they throw him overboard. And the moment he hits the water, the scripture said that the storm just ceased. Calm. And the men on the boat are exceedingly afraid because that, this is a sign to them that this God of Jonah, who they don't really know, is the God who commands the wind and the sea. And a fish comes and swallows up Jonah. And he's at the belly of the fish. Now, this story, at this point, before we go on, I want you to remind you of another story that happened to Yeshua, because there's a great parallel. You see, Yeshua also was on the way to an unclean Gentile nation one day on a boat. And as he was on the boat, he was also sleeping on the boat. His disciples were manning it. And on the way, a wind pick up, picked up. A storm started ravaging around him, so much so that the disciples come, they shake him, help us, we're going to die. And he, he looks at them and he says, why are you afraid? Do you not have faith? And he waves his hand, and with a wave of his hand, the storm just ceases, calms down. And just like those men on the boat with Jonah, they are exceedingly astonished. And they say, they think, who is this man that he commands the wind? You see, the disciples were very familiar with the story of Jonah. And in the story of Jonah, the one who commanded the wind was the father himself. And now the one who commanded the wind is this man on the boat. He's making a statement. He's saying, I am who I am. I am. That's why they were the way they were. It was much deeper. They knew the context. They knew the story. That's why Yeshua brought up the story of Jonah so often in his ministry. He was trying to get us to look there because there's a lot there for us to see. So what, is, what else is there to see? You see, when we look at it, I want you to think about how both, of, both uh, Jonah as well as Yeshua is on the way to a, like I said, an unclean nation. We do not know God. Jonah is sent to Nineveh and Yeshua is sent to the Gadarenes. And so in this story, as they're going there, I want you to think about how why Jonah ran? Because like I said, it's, it's not just about the fact that he was running from God. The real question is, why do you run from God? What's the reason? Why do you not go there? 
You see, Jonah is sent by God to Nineveh. Nineveh is an unclean nation. And for Jonah to say, I don't want to go there, it's quite obvious. He knows that God has mercy. He knows that his God has pity on those who are unclean and who do not know him. And what Jonah really doesn't want to have happen is he actually doesn't want to see those people get saved. They, he doesn't want to see these unclean people. He doesn't want to have the same pity on them that he knows God has. And this is why. This is the thing that keeps him from going out there. You see, brothers and sisters, I want to ask you the question. My fear has been that sometimes if we dig deep, one of the real reasons that some of the people in this movement don't, are so hesitant at reaching others, going out, sometimes it's because we don't actually want them to have what we have. Because some of us have become so comfortable with this as becoming who we are. We are Hebrews, we are Israel, we are all these things, and they outside are not. And as long as we can be here and say who we are to each other and, and sing Kumbaya together, we feel special, right? Because it makes us unique. It's the same thing that that Pharisee with that woman was in. He was a Jew, God is of the God of the Jews. He is not the God of the sinners. That's how he thought of it. Even today, many think so. And in this movement, we face the same danger. It's a religious spirit. That spirit of, that makes you think, oh, I, I don't want really those people because first, I hate them. I don't want them to come to God. And even if I know my God is the type of God that wants their hearts, I don't know if I do. You see, think of that. Because this is why what happened to Jonah happens to Jonah. But see, Jonah's on the boat. Why does he not, when they, the captain comes to him and says, call out to your God, do something, help, you know, let's, let's try and... Jonah doesn't. He's on the boat. He, he, doesn't have, he doesn't call out to his God. Why not? Well, Jonah's busy running. You see, Jonah's busy in rebellion. And he feels that because I'm in this place of running in rebellion, I don't know if I, I, I'm not going to speak to him right now. It's kind of like Adam and Eve. In the garden, Adam and Eve, they sin. They're in, they're in that rebellion. And what do they do? They run. They hide in the bushes because they believe that God is just like they are. That God is unforgiving. That God has no pity. That God would never forgive them for doing that, but they were wrong. God walks through the garden and He calls their name. Why does He walk through the garden and call their name if He's abandoned them? If He has no forgiveness to offer? If He has no pity on them? You see, sometimes we think of God as being like how we are. We think of how someone has hurt us, and we think of how, I don't know, I don't want to have mercy, I don't feel like it. Well, God is different than you are, and that's why He sent Jonah. God is different than Jonah. That's why He sent Jonah. Jonah knew it, but he didn't want to go anyway. You know who your God is. You're sitting here. Will you go, even if it's to a people you don't really want to go? Because here's the, the scary part. When you think about Yeshua's journey, He's on the boat. He's going to this unclean nation, just like Jonah's going to an unclean nation. This is the story where Yeshua gets to the destination, gets off the boat, and he is faced with these demoniacs, these people who have demons. And he, this is the story where he casts the demons into pigs. And what happens to the pigs? The pigs run into the sea, and they drown. The same place Jonah went tossed into the sea. You see, if you think about it this way, Jonah didn't want to go to that nation because they were unclean. Nineveh was unclean. They were dwelling with the pigs. They had the sin. And when Yeshua, he comes with to the sin. He caused the sin out of the person into the pigs that eventually go into the sea. And Jonah, for his sin of not desiring to have pity like his father has, not desiring to love like his father has, love those who are unclean, he ends up in the same place where the sins of those unclean people are sent. 
Think about that. The ocean, that place, the irony. God is making a point. He is trying to reach Jonah's heart at this point. And Jonah is at the, bo- at the bottom of it, and, and he cries out. He says this, Jonah 2 verse 2, I call out to the Lord out of my distress. He answered me out of the belly of Sheol. I cried, and you heard my voice. You see, no matter who you are, how many commandments you think you keep, how religious you are, if you're going to be as self-righteous as Jonah is, you will end up in the same place as the unclean people you don't like. Right? And what, look at what Jonah says. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried. When he's in the bottom, I mean, I can just imagine being in the, bo- in the belly of a fish. He probably thought he was like dead. Like, he probably thought he was in Sheol, right? And he's saying, I'm crying out of the belly of Sheol. And he's offering up this prayer to the Lord. The point is this. All of us in this room, we're going to a thing called the grave. We're all going to end up in the ground unless he comes and, and takes us up. Either way, you're going to face death one day. This mortal flesh is not going to go through, Right? So no matter who you are, no matter any of that, you're all going to the same grave. The big question is this, will you be raised? And the big thing with that is, you're not going to raise yourself. It's not about how many Sabbaths you kept that's going to raise you. It's not about how many pigs you turned down of eating. (laughs) It's not about any of that. At the end of the day, yes, we are sanct- we're sanctified by Him and we continue in desiring to walk like He did in holiness. But that's not what makes you get raised. Because if it was, you wouldn't need Him in the first place. It's because He raised that you raised. It's because He forgave you that you're forgiven. And we need to keep that perspective because whether it's a sinner or a righteous man, we're all going to the grave. The only thing that makes you different really, the only reason you're really here versus not is because you have knowledge that some others don't have. You know in your heart, soul, and mind, and everything in you that Yeshua is king. He, the ruler of the, the real ruler, the real king. And there are other people outside who they may have been exposed to that knowledge, but they didn't believe it. They haven't experienced him the way you did. They didn't have the knowledge. And that's really one of the main things that sets you apart. If you think about Nineveh, it's interesting what, what God does. Or if you think about Jonah, Jonah, he's in, the, he's in the belly of the fish. What is it that causes the fish to spit him out? What, what, what could Jonah possibly do to allow, to move God's hand to have that kind of mercy? Because Jonah is in sin. Is it, the, is it his prayers? Is it how sorry he is? Well, if it was how sorry someone is that wipes their sins, then we should just be sorry enough. But that's not it. God looks upon Jonah. He says, my son is, has sinned. He has fallen, but he is repenting. And I'm going to make a way for him. And years later, God does. He comes in the flesh. He atones for Jonah. And past, present, future, he atones for all on the cross. It is his atonement that gets Jonah out of the belly of the fish. He raised and Jonah was raised out of the belly of the fish. Micah 7.18, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of His inheritance? He does not retain His anger forever because He delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You see what Yeshua did was when He came to those men, those unclean people who he was supposed to hate like Jonah would have. What does Yeshua do? He recognizes there is a son of mine behind this demon oppressing him. And he calls out the demons into the pigs, into the sea. You see, Yeshua was able to love unlike Jonah 
because Yeshua made distinction. Yeshua understood who his real enemy was. Some of you want to tear each other apart or tear others apart who didn't think the way you do. But here's the deal. You are just as blind as Jonah in that case because you're just seeing a demon and thinking that's the person. Because you're not making distinction the way that Yeshua did. Yeshua said, this is my son. There is a demon. I am casting out the demon because that's my enemy. He came to destroy the kingdom of darkness, not people. He came to show pity on people. He understood if, if I could make distinction, I can go for the demon and the person can be free. And what did those men tell him when he was about to leave? Can we come with you? Can we come with you? They were so free that they said, I want to turn 180 and I want to follow you. I want to just go where you are. So what does, what does Jonah do? He's, he's now spit out by the, by the fish, and he ends up now <laughs> going on the right track. He heads to Nineveh. Because you see, now the kindness, the mercy, the love of God has reached him. He has seen that God has delivered him. And because Jonah has been forgiven much, he now can love more. But it's not that Jonah hasn't ever been forgiven. He just didn't realize it. You see, because you need to see your own sin in order to repent of it. And when you repent of it, he says in his word, I will forgive it. And when he has forgiven it, you will love more because you understand the forgiveness offered to you. That's what made that Pharisee different. That's what made Jonah now direct his sails back to Nineveh. But what does he do? This is where the story gets kind of funny. Because Jonah comes and he walks through Nineveh. He says, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. And, and then eventually, as he walks through it all, and the king gets wind of it, king of Nineveh, the people, all alike, start repenting, fasting. Okay, and he, Jonah goes and he goes on the east side of the city. He sets up, he looks over the city and to see what will happen to Nineveh. And as he does this, a, a branch comes over his head and to give them, gives him some shade. And, and Jonah is really grateful because it's really hot outside. And the next day that a worm comes and he, he eats this, these leaves and the sun is now back, exposed, and, and Jonah has pity on the plant. He thinks, well, this, this plant, it, it just died. The, the worm just ate it. And God comes to Jonah, and he says, Jonah, this plant you did not work for, you did not labor for. This plant lives today, dies tomorrow. This plant has no, this is, you know what its value is. It's a plant, but yet, can I not have pity on Nineveh who has over 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left? You know what's really interesting with that statement? Is, is he's saying they don't know their right hand from their left. But why when Jonah walked through Nineveh, he never told them what to repent from. Think about it. He walks through, he just says, you're going to be overthrown. <laughs> they all knew what, what they were doing wrong. They just needed the knowledge that there was a God who cared about it. Because <clears throat> see, here's the deal. All of us, you remove God from the picture. People, they try to be good people, even people who don't believe. They, I try to be a good person, they'll tell you. As long as, as, long as it, their interests are, it, they're motivated by their interests and their morality. In other words, they'll only do good as long as it, it's motivated by their own interests. The moment that it's not going to benefit me, I, maybe I'll twist the rules a bit. Except if there's something outside, someone outside of us who cares about whether we do right and wrong. Amen. It's simply the knowledge. Everyone knows really what's right and wrong. And the question is really, do they care? And what is going to make them care is the knowledge of God. Now here's the big question is what God is really telling Jonah. How can you have pity on a plant that dies, lives today, dies tomorrow, and not have pity on Nineveh. And the only thing that makes you different from Nineveh is the fact that you have the knowledge of me. You know that I continuously look upon your works. I continuously am there. I am looking. That's why you are different, Jonah, just because of that. And does that make you more valuable than Nineveh? 
Does that make you more set apart? Do you think that I am going to, you think you have so, mu so much more righteousness? It's really what he is getting at. You see, brothers and sisters, Jonah is in this place and he's sitting there and he's looking and even after being coming out of the belly of the fish, he still doesn't learn the lesson that I am Yahweh. And it is not you that by your own works, your own righteousness and all that you think you are, that you have worked out your own salvation. I am the one who has saved you. And if you think that it's you, you're going to think it's you and you're going to look down on others because of that, because it's how well you kept the Sabbath and how badly they don't. But at the end of the day, Jonah's sin was greater than Nineveh itself. Think about that. Nineveh was an exceedingly wicked nation, but Jonah as a religious man had worse sin because of his self-righteousness. In fact, Yeshua said the same about the Pharisees in his day who came against him. He said the following, uh, Matthew 12, 41, the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment of this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Behold, something than greater than Jonah is here. He's saying, you, you lead Jewish leadership who came against, come against me, don't recognize me. Nineveh will rise up. That wicked nation will rise up in judgment against you. Because, and what was the greatest sin? This is the, great, this is the craziest thing. What's the greatest sin that these Jewish leaders who came against Yeshua had? That they, ne that every t they even wanted to stone him in the, in the book of Luke. Why? Because he get, got up there talking about how God had mercy on Gentiles and pagans before. You see, they couldn't take it that God would have mercy and pity on an unclean nation. Just like yesterday we talked how God had to come to Peter. This was pervasive, this idea. And this idea is the, the, one of the greatest dangers that is faced by men and women of God alike who go to church. Because that's what causes us to not want to go forth. But here's the crazy thing. That, that captain who came on the ship to Jonah, he says this, Call out to your God. Perhaps your God will have a thought to us that we may not perish, right? Brothers and sisters, just like that captain came to Jonah on that ship, there are people around you, all around you when you go into this world, whose souls are crying out because they're on boats who, that are being rocked. They are in a storm. You see, if, if Yeshua is not on the boat, if Yeshua doesn't wave His hand, they're on a storm. And they, if they don't have Yeshua, that storm is just getting worse and worse and worse. And their souls are crying out and they don't even know it to you because you're the righteous man on the boat. And they're saying, call out to your God that He has mercy on us. You see, these men didn't even know what they were really asking for because they didn't even know who Jonah was nor who his God was. But their souls were crying out. And this is what is happening around you. When you walk in that man who looks really angry at God, his soul is crying out for God. And it is you who should go and not be like Jonah. I mean, can you just think, Jonah's on the boat. These men don't even, how could it be that he's a prophet of God and these men don't even know who his God is until it's at the end of it? There's something wrong with this picture. Jonah didn't want to have these men even on the boat see, see repentance, just like Nineveh. So where is our heart with this thing? I, I am quite surprised because it says in Jonah 3 verse 4, he go, went into the city going a day's journey and he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And that's all he did. That, that's what it says. It, they, he just did that. He just said that. And that's what caused him to repent. I'm surprised because that must have been the Spirit of God that just moved on these people's hearts because it wasn't Jonah's words, let me tell you, that made anyone want to repent. Because if someone walked through this city or that city and just started screaming that in the streets, you really, who's going to listen? Why would I listen to that? I don't even know any of what I'm, who is this God? And there's none of that is given. You see, God works, and the Spirit of God can do that as He did, but God works through Jonah despite Jonah. You see, God, God has had to get him there. Jonah never, even by the way end of it, even after being through the fish, Jonah still didn't want to. God worked through him despite him. My question to you is, look, God's going to work through you. 
But is it going to work through you despite you or because of the way you love? Because Jonah had no love, but thankfully our Father's love is even greater than a man's and greater than a man who doesn't want to show pity and greater than a man who doesn't want to love. God will use him regardless, but Jonah's still going to stand before God and he's still going to have to say, why didn't you love the way I loved? Why did I have to really, why were you like a barrier? I did what I needed to do, but you were, do you understand, brothers and sisters, how many of us are sometimes a barrier because, and God has to work through us despite our issues, despite our, how we see people, despite our hearts that don't really want to see someone come to repentance. And you know, you can say, Petey, I'm not like that. Well, your actions speak louder than your words. Because if, you, if, you, if Jonah really wanted Nineveh to repent, he would be in Nineveh from the get-go God told him to. That's the thing. He can say what he wants, say what he thinks, but at the end of the day, if you, want, if you really are breaking for the people, if you really have passion for them to, to see them come, you'd be out there. And if you're not out there, you can come and tell me, oh, I love all people, and you can tell God that, and I'll say, all right, I hope so. Because if you're not out there, your actions speak louder than your words. Because I bet you, Jonah, he would have been probably, you know, like, oh, you know, I love all people, you know, because I'm supposed, that's what the book says I should do, love my neighbor, oh, yeah, I do that. But did he, did he? You see, I want to tell you another story. There's a man, his name is Pilate. He's up there. And he tells the crowd, on this day, this feast of Passover, I will release a prisoner unto you, whomever you desire, anyone you want. And the people, it says this, and there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had insurrection with him and had committed murder in the insurrection. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, what will you then that I shall do unto him whom you call the king of the Jews? And the people, they look, and they cry out, crucify him. And Pilate, he, he's, a, he's a pagan. He's, he, he's just, he's not a religious man. But he comes, he's astonished. He says, whoa, 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 what do you mean? And he, what do you mean? And he says, what evil has he done? What has he done? And, and they cried out all the more exceedingly, crucify him. You see, in the one corner, we have a man, his name is Barabbas an insurrectionist of Rome, a murderer, a sinner of all sinners. There's nothing that he's got going for him. He is enchained, awaiting conviction and execution, most certainly. On the other hand, in the other corner, we have a man, his name is Yeshua. Some call him the King of the Jews. Some call him the Messiah of the world. And as far as we can see, None of the accusations that came against him bear any weight. The, the witnesses don't even agree. He's never murdered anyone in, the, in his heart, never mind in his hand and in his flesh. He has never dishonored his mother or father, never covered at anything that's not his, never looked at a woman of lust, never lied, never stolen, never gossiped, never done anything wrong. And yet they cry out to him, crucify him. You see, when I look at this event, it's the single most unjust moment in all of history. A murderer versus a man who has never sinned, and there's only been one of them, and they pick the worst of the worst, the sinner, the murderer. But you know what's crazy is that I'm a part of this story. Because in that crowd, when they were crying out, crucify him, I was standing in that crowd, right there. I was crying out, crucify him. Because at the end of the day, it was the sins of the people who was crying out, crucify him. Because at the end of the day, it is your sin that was the cause for him to go to the cross. But you know that guy Barabbas, that horrible sinner, I was just like him, enchained by my own sin, awaiting conviction and certain execution. Because my sins, they're going to lead to death. 
But a man comes and knocks on, opens Barabbas's cell. And as the cell door squeaks open, he says, Barabbas, you can go. I mean, can you imagine? But Barabbas, he's in, he's in chain there. He's thinking, what, what do you mean I can go? I, I did this. I, I, I've made peace with my destiny. I am going to die. Romans have captured me. I'm here. I am a murderer. I, this is how it goes. No one has ever been out this way. What do you mean I can just go? Barabbas, just go. There is a man, the king of the Jews, Yeshua. He is dying instead of you. And Barabbas is just, it, you know, it's interesting because the scriptures just say that he just kind of, he just kind of went. He just, he just kind of ran. And as he ran down the stairs, he probably ran by Yeshua, probably got a glimpse of him there. But the scriptures don't say Barabbas was like, hey, hey, I owe you everything. Thank you for dying, you know, instead of me. No, he, he just, he just kind of goes. And he, he doesn't really take a second look and, it's kind of interesting because he had a second chance at life. And this second chance of life was so amazing for him that he didn't even take a second look at eternal life standing right there. And he's looking at this, sec this chance of life that God has given him. And this draws him in. What do you mean? We can say, God, why, why are you allowing this man, Barabbas, to go free? And you show, I mean, you could have chosen a sinner not as ungrateful and undeserving, but the only problem is you're just like him. How many times in your life and in my life have I been lured in by the world by something and second chance because every day is a second chance with breath in our lungs and how many times have we chosen something there instead of something back here called salvation Amen. called Yeshua my Savior chosen my kingdom my thing instead of Him <laughs> well now you start realizing I'm actually just like Barabbas you see Brothers and sisters, I deserve the highest cross. I deserve the deepest, darkest pit you can find. And you can get the hottest oven you could find, and you can throw away the key after throwing me in there. And I deserve every bit of it. You say, PD, you don't look like such a bad guy. You don't, you don't, I, I don't know if that's true. Except in the book of Isaiah we read, we have all become like one who is unclean. We have all become like Nineveh. We have all become like that sinner, that woman who came into the house. We have all become like one who is unclean. And he says, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind takes us away. You see, that leaf came over Jonah. And that leaf faded away in a day. We're all just like that leaf if it comes to down to what we've done. But see, if it was for just what none of us did, yes, none of us had no chance. Thank our Father, it wasn't about what none of us or Jonah or anyone did. It was about what He did. It was about what He did on the cross. And so now we see this, 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 this picture, Yeshua, I'm the one who deserves all that. Yeshua, the one who doesn't deserve any of it. And while Barabbas walks away, I believe in, in my heart that Yeshua probably prayed to his father and he just said, Father, that's okay, let him go. Take me instead. Take me instead. Yes, let him go. Let him experience my kindness. Take me instead. That's what he does for every sinner. And at the end of the day, what we see is we have now Yeshua. He goes to that highest cross. He goes to that deep, deepest, darkest pit, that place called Sheol. But why is it you see, brothers and sisters, sometimes even after coming to faith in Him, we still find ourselves enchained. We find ourselves in a jail cell. We find ourselves in, uh, chained down by our sins. And then we think, if I could just shake long enough, I could get free. You see, even Barabbas was astonished. Even Barabbas had made peace with his death. But sometimes we think that we could shake ourselves free. We think that if I could just... Do it. But you see, there's been religions before you and men before you for thousands of years that have tried every other religion except 
believing in our one true God, believes that if I could do enough righteous things, I could get out of this. If I do enough righteous deeds, if I can shake enough, these chains will break and I can be free. At the end of the day, nothing is breaking those chains. Nothing is allowing that jail door to be opened unless it's the one who comes and knocks and says, it was Yeshua who took your place. And it is so the power of Yeshua's sacrifice that breaks your chains. It is not you. Amen. You have to have that person knock on the door, that guard swing your door open. Because there's no other way that you're going to be able to do this. This temptation, this sin you're in, this curse you feel you're under, nothing you can do of yourself can break it. You, you can't do it. You can get free from this and you're enchained in that. The enemy, you have no power over him alone. But if you have belief in the power of God, and you put all your dependence, all your trust in Him, He can break those chains. But my fear is that sometimes some of us, we, even if we say we believe in Him for something as big as salvation, we struggle to believe in Him for something as small as my pornography addiction. As small as the fact that I run my mouth with my kids in anger and wrath. As something as small as the fact that I covet things I ought not to covet or look upon things I ought not to look or the fact that I struggle to honor my father or mother or the fact that I, whatever it is, you say, yeah, let me just try a little harder next time. I'm going to be able to do this. No, you won't. No, you won't. Barabbas couldn't. No one could. No one ever could. Why do you think you can? You see, brothers and sisters, I want you to see this perspective so that you look at yourself for who you are, redeemed, but without Him, totally, totally, totally lost, totally unredeemed, totally worth nothing. You see, but here's the deal. When you go to a store, the value of something is determined by what someone is willing to pay for it. And heaven went bankrupt, if you will. Amen. Yeshua went on the cross. He died. And if he was willing to give up, if your king was willing to give up his life for you, it talks about your value. So yes, you can say, well, yeah, I've, I've done all these things and people have told me I'm not worthy. My parents never told me I would never be worth anything in life. And look, Petey, I've, I've done horrible, I've done some horrible things. And I'm not worth it. And, you know, I'll say, yeah, if, it, if your value was based on what you've done, sure thing. But guess what? It's not. Because your value is determined by what someone's willing to pay. And God did pay with His own life. Amen. So don't tell me you're not worthy. Don't tell me that you are worthy. See, it's just this balance. You're totally worthy, but because of Him, not because of yourself. So now you can't look down on anyone else because of what you've done, you can only see them as yourself, even if they, are, they have a few rough edges that you don't have. You have your rough edges just in a different spot, trust me. Amen. At the end of the day, we're all alike, more alike than we like to admit. And so, brothers and sisters, if we can get this, we will not be like Jonah. We will not be running from God in the slightest. We will be running to Nineveh. We will be eager to go, hungry, because we will see that, hey, they're actually just like me. But I want to tell them about something that I have that can open my, that open my jail cell and will open theirs. And when they experience the love, the kindness, the mercy of God through you, as God is working through you, not despite you, just maybe they would want a taste of this free gift of salvation as well. Father, I just thank you, Lord, that you just show us our value through the cross. But also, Father, I thank you, Lord, for keeping our hearts in order. That we ought not to look of ourselves as being better, as being higher, as something worth boasting about in terms of over others. Lord, I just pray that you would come right now, Lord. We submit our hearts wherever we have ever been. Wherever we've ever been like Jonah, whenever we've been thought twice about going to someone, because they've been a mean person, a sinner, a worse sinner than Barabbas maybe even, it doesn't matter. Lord, I, we repent right now for every single time we thought like that. 
we thought like Peter, Yeshua, who's the better one? Father, I just pray that you would come and give a fire, put a fire in our hearts as we repent of this, to run to Nineveh, to be like Yeshua who went on the boat, who calmed the storm because he was in alignment with his father. He wasn't running. And Father, I just thank you that you would, you would help us to see the difference between what the sin is and the person is, just like you do, so that we can cast out the demons instead of run our mouth at some person who is being oppressed. Father, I just pray that you would come, Lord, and Lord, let this be an event, a time right now, a moment in, in our spirit that you come of your Holy Spirit and right now touch every heart here with the hunger, with the thirst to see the sinner come to you. Father, I thank you for all that you have done in our midst. And Lord, I know that this is a message that you're giving as you're saying, I am showing mercy upon you. Even when we have fallen short, you show mercy. Just like you want to show mercy on those who aren't in this room this year, but will be here next year because you're drawing Nineveh. You're showing pity. And this is this harvest season. This is Shavuot. This is the time of harvest, the time of bringing in, calling the bride by your spirit. We worship you. We praise you. All in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Let's praise Him. Can we just praise Him? Come on. Amen.